So welcome everyone to Straight Science. Straight Science is an evening science presentation series put on by University of Alaska Fairbanks um, Northwest Campus in Nome and University of Alaska Fairbanks Alaska Sea Grant also in Nome and tonight you're in the home office. And both Northwest Campus and Alaska Sea Grant, we are public servants of the Bering Strait region. We serve all peoples of the Bering Strait region, which is the homeland and waters of the Inupiaq, Yupik, and St. Lawrence Island Yupik peoples. So tonight, we're very excited to talk crab. There's been news, recent news of crab, and we have the first speaker. Well, they're going to do it together, kind of in tandem, and we've got Sarah Wise. She is a social scientist with the NOAA Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Seattle. And she will be followed by Jessica Reynolds, who is a social scientist, and I have to look at my notes, social scientist with the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission. So like everything else changing in the Bering Strait region, we have experienced changes in our ecosystem, changes in the crab, and that's what we're gonna focus on. And Jessica and Sarah have been doing a project in the Bering Strait region, um, learning how observations, sort of integrating local observations can make for better science, make for better data, make for better management. So with that, Sarah, you're going to be first up because we're going to learn what Norton Sound had to say. And just so the audience knows, uh, I asked beforehand and they're happy if questions come at any time. They're happy if it becomes even a conversation. So don't wait till the end if you don't want to. You can always check in as well. I'll be monitoring the chat box. And with that, take it away, Sarah. Let us know, Red King Crab, how we chimed Thanks, in. Gay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gay. And good evening to everyone here. Thanks for coming. And a huge thanks to Bering Strait our Bear Straight Science talk um, to invite us and have us here and give us an opportunity to talk about our research um, at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center around the Norton Sound area. I do want to say, please chime in, uh, ask questions along the way for clarification or just discussion, that would be great. We will should have some time at the end to ask questions as well. That said, um, I'm kind of juggling some screens, so that would be great, Gay, and also Jess, if you want to make sure that I'm not just ignoring something in the chat or if somebody's waving their hand, that would be great. So um, some of you listening here today, and I'm, I'm recognizing some of the names, were very graciously part of this study as well. So thank you as well to you all for being part of this research, and hopefully we can have a lively discussion as we go. So as Gay said, I'm Sarah Wise. I'm an anthropologist at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center and I'm based in Seattle uh, and then travel to Alaska region, primarily um, Western Alaska region, Bering Sea uh, and northward. There's a, another social scientist at the center who uh, really focuses on the Gulf area. So we do a lot of work in the Western Alaska area and really focusing on communities, community well-being, fishing, and ways to inform management bodies uh, with the best available science and information in order to make their management decisions about fisheries in the area. So, and I'm here with Jessica Reynolds, who is also a social scientist with the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission. And we're going to talk about our recent, most recent work with the Norton Sound communities um, to uh, look at some of the impacts on uh, the Red King Crab, Norton Sound Red King Crab fisheries declines that have been going on and how things have changed in the fisheries over time. <clears throat> so I'm going to try and handle my screen at the same time. <laughs> Um, so I'm sure some of you, many of you have seen a lot of the headlines that have popped up both in the local media as well as uh, globe, national and international media as well, talking about how crab fisheries 
um, in general in Alaska have declined. And then also specifically the Norton Sound red king crab population and how that's impacted subsistence and commercial fisheries in the region. So we're interested really specifically in how communities are have experienced these changes, um, how people are adjusting to some of these changes, what they've witnessed and observed over time. And by collecting the, this local knowledge on the changing red king crab stocks, we're hoping that this work can then inform decision making um, through crab plan team, through council processes, um, by, by sort of highlighting how people in Norton Sound have been impacted. And then the, secondarily, the importance of fisheries knowledge in management processes. So uh, I know there was a straight science talk a little while ago and that really took a deep drive into the Norton Sound Red King Crab. So I'm going to be very brief on that part of it. But I do want to just <clears throat> say a few words. Um, the the Red, Norton Sound Red King Crab is uh, jointly managed by federal um, management plan and by uh, the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. Um, and they are the ones that set the limits for red king crab after receiving reports from federal and state biologists. And then ADFNG has also um, a, a joint management part of that process. And this is both for summer and winter commercial fisheries. Um, and then there's also, in addition to that, a winter subsistence fishery and a smaller but um, strong summer subsistence fishery as well. And this is, has been true historically. There are permits are required to fish Norton Sound red king crab. Um, however, commercial fisheries have primarily sold to the Norton Sound Economic Development Corporation. So with that one buyer that exclusively buys from Norton Sound residents, that is um, a, a way in which uh, fisher, fishermen have sold um, to that one buyer. And they're also um, a pretty central uh, institution that, that kind of shapes the, the, the flow of the fishery in the area as well. Oh, and just actually just to quickly, um, when we talked, we did do a policy map or, or an overview of the policy changes over time. And um, it's, it's, there's been a lot of changes in, uh, in, in the last, say, decade or two. Um, but, uh, and we'll show it into the next slide, how the permits themselves and the number of the permits have changed. So in 1994, um, <clears throat> There was uh, the for the summer commercial fishery. There's this super exclusive de designation, and the purpose of that was really shifting fishery um, to smaller vessels and smaller harvests. And the purpose was to strengthen the stock over time and to support sustainability in the fishery. With that, um, there was also um, a limited liability program in 2000, which then further was an attempt to strengthen the fishery and limit uh, the, the, the number of people in the fishery. The summer and winter commercial fisheries, um, there was no uh, winter harvest limit before 2016. And then after 2000, I think it was 2000, 16, it was limited to just 8% of the guideline harvest levels. Prior to that, there wasn't a limit. So took, taking a look at the fishing permits, and here we have a figure that um, has all the winter subsistence, summer subsistence, winter commercial, and summer commercial fisheries, the number of permits within each sector. We can start to see some trends. And the Norton Sound Red King crab fisheries are very small in general. There's uh, in 2021, there were only, sorry, 2022, there were only 27 permits, permit holders that were registered in the summer commercial fishery. So we're not talking about an enormous fishery um, in the area, but it is one that is incredibly important to uh, communities in Norton Sound in multiple ways. And we're going to get into that a little bit 
um, as we go through this project. So in 2021, the, in the summer commercial fishery, there are only nine permit holders. And, and that really um, reflects the fact that the NSECC decided to, in, to pause buying of Red King crab in order to strengthen the stock. And so that drop in permit holding was really a reflection of that. In 2021, 2022, winter subsistence fisheries uh, issued 125 permits. And to give some context for this, in 2019, Red King crab stocks experienced record declines with commercial fisheries harvest dropping 76% since 2018 and 83% lower av than average of harvest numbers for the previous five years. So there was a very, um, striking decline. And so um, that that is what triggered the NSEDC to suspend purchasing of Red King crab and then um, in, in an effort to try and slow down um, the harvest and increase the strength. And then of course in 2021 there was the um, natural de declaration of um, fisheries disaster under the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And um, that it put a halt to harvesting in general. The aim uh, at that point in 2021 was when the North Pacific Council decided that um, there had been a lot of effort towards uh, fishery sustainability and trying to uh, get the stock, bolster the stock, but very little information had been gathered from people who actually fished Norton Sound Red King Crab and who had watched um, and observed over decades. And so there was a call from the council bodies to um, do, excuse me, do a case study on Red King Crab. And the aim was to really gather valuable local information, local knowledge to gain an understanding of Red King crab fisheries, as well as community reliance and impacts on how things have changed. So before we dive into the study, just a note of who we are. I knew we introduced ourselves, but I wanted to say a few words about what social, what it means to be a social scientist doing this kind of work. We're trained as social scientists to gather and document people's observations, their experiences, their stories, or what we also call their data um, from people in relation to a particular topic. And in this case, it's Norton Sound Red King Crab fisheries um, since about uh, 2004. And then really I start to identify key themes, patterns, and then the underlying meanings of some of that information. And so our work is really a collaboration with the people we're working with who are gracious enough to talk with us. So we're in no way experts about Norton Sound Red King Crab. We're not managers. We don't live in the Norton Sound region and we certainly aren't fishermen, but um, we are trained on how to work with this kind of information. Our work really always depends on who's willing to talk with us and what information people are willing to share with us. So um, in that way, this isn't um, representative of every single person in Norton Sound because we certainly didn't talk to every single person, but it is supposed to give an illustration and a glimpse into some of the themes that cropped up in these conversations. So on to our study. The purpose of this, oh yeah. <clears throat> yeah, this is Roy Ashenfelter. Was there any, data or any um, information in regards to the pandemic and its effects on everyone not being able to, you know, catch, catch or, you know, because of the pandemic, a lot of things weren't done, including maybe crab fishing. Um, I certainly didn't do it, um, but um, was there any information in regards to how the pandemic, pandemic may have improved the crab because no one was actually getting crab in volume? 
That is a great question and, um, and a complicated one because there's so many factors involved. Um, in terms of uh, Red King Crab, during the pandemic, that was also the same time NSEDC decided not to do the purchasing in, in 2021. So it's difficult to know if the numbers that we saw of crab we saw after that um, reflected the, the, the reduction in harvest or if it was also a reduction in harvest because of the pandemic. So it's a little hard to kind of untangle those uh, drivers of what, how, um, how the stock itself reacted to that. I will say there's been a lot of research on fisheries, um, sort of more broadly on the U.S. level as well as um, just specific to Alaska in other fisheries, and there's been a lot of Im direct impacts that we've been able to tease out from the pandemic, including. Um, just how, uh, how crews responded, how skippers responded, and how entire fleets responded, and then also which um, fisheries may have rebounded a little bit faster than others. We just don't have um, maybe enough information in Norton Sound Red King Crab because it's a much smaller fishery and a lot going on. <laughs> but thanks for the question. That's that's and great. I would like to add just briefly in some of my conversations, like there is now some qualitative data on, on that from talking with a number of individuals, though our sample size, which I'll talk about in a few moments, is very small. Um, it's still meaningful. So some people that I spoke with had ideas as to how COVID was affecting their um, participation within um, Norton Sound Red King crab fisheries during those years of COVID as well. So hopefully we can do something with that in the future. Did that answer your question, Roy? Yes, thank you. Um, just right. a, yeah, just a side note. No, I won't tell you guys that, but it, I'll, I'll wait till the information continue, continues. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Roy. And um, Sarah, are you good with your screen? It looks like on mine, you've, your screen sharing is, is everyone else seeing a completely black screen? It looks normal to me. So right, yeah, there, you it tell just me, is it in. black? Oh, nope. Okay. I have more. Norton, we, you yeah, got I it? have Norton Sound purpose and objectives. Perfect. Okay. All right, me too. Okay, I must have had an internet satellite glitch. All right, onwards. Let's <laughs> All on. right. So the purpose of the study was to include local ecological knowledge of red king crab fisheries. And we'll go through some of these definitions in a bit to better understand how conditions have changed over time for improved ecosystem-based fisheries management. And uh, we really divided this up into three objectives. First, documenting observed changes by talking with people, how has uh, the commercial and subsistence fisheries, how have they changed over time? And then two, to examine the social and ecological effects of these changes on Norton Sound communities. So how are people experiencing these changes? And three, to better then, to better understand community perspectives and concerns about red king crab. And this got into um, conversations about management implications as well, which we'll talk about a little bit as we go. So just to quickly define some of these concepts that we are talking about, ecosystem-based fisheries management or EBFM is basically a, an approach to fisheries management in a geographically specific specified area, say Norton Sound, that contributes to the resilience and sustainability of the ecosystem. It recognizes the physical, biological, economic, and social interactions among affected fisheries-related components of the ecosystem. And very importantly, this includes humans. And it seeks to optimize benefits among a diverse set of societal goals. So this was first developed or really formalized in 2016, and it really changed the way that fisheries are managed, one from single species targets to much broader perspective and one that includes humans and how fisheries um, affect and impact humans. So the second one, local ecological knowledge, is 
really a, a, a thing that describes the knowledge, the insights, the observations that are acquired through extensive observation and interaction of an area or species. And it provides additional data, climate data, ecological data, um, and it, is, it, it expands beyond Western science uh, methods as well. There's a lot of literature about how the methods that um, are around local ecological knowledge, how to use it, how to gather it, and so forth. It's also been shown to increase trust among managers and fishers. It can lead to fisheries, um, improved health in fisheries, and it really affects, um, it reflects the insight about relationships and interactions among humans and non-human species. Food sovereignty is a third term I will throw in here just because we're going to be talking about it a lot as we go, is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods. So as we talk about these things, keep the definitions in mind as we go. Any questions on that as we go, do feel free to ask. So just to very briefly talk about um, methods that we used, we an analyzed fisheries performance data from 2004 to 2021. We were able to incorporate some of the data that we had available in 2022 as well. And then we followed that up with um, ex extensive um, open-ended ethnographic interviews. All of this was done on the phone because of the pandemic, because originally we planned to do it in person. We had to pivot like so much, so many of us did. And so we did these ethnographic interviews by phone. And then we um, identified these participants through um, permit holding, through fisheries, and then of course people saying, oh, you really have to talk to this person and that person because they know so much. And if they're willing to talk to us, we certainly did. These included marine resource users, subsistence fishers, com um, fishermen, commercial fishermen, indigenous and non-indigenous community members, and, and anyone who um, had been engaged in fishing, uh, red king crab fishing. And then we did extensive uh, qualitative analysis, text analysis, narrative analysis, and coding of that data. Uh, so, whoops, sorry. Uh, so we found in all of this, and Jessica is going to go through um, some of the, uh, the, the in-depth themes and results of what we found. But I have up here the slide for the results. And Jess, I realized, um, if you want to talk more about the methods too, I think I jumped ahead once. But I'm going to hand this over to Jess and just let me know when you want me to switch over the slides. Awesome, we'll do. Um, and no problem, we'll just, I'll pick up right where you left off here with the results. So I will talk about what is it that we found during this study. Um, I think you covered the methods pretty, pretty well. But if anybody has any um, additional questions about the methods um, and more details, I'm happy to answer those um, either now or at the end of the presentation. Um, so again, I'll talk about what we found. Um, and I had the uh, pleasure to talk with Norton Sound community members um, throughout the study, um, throughout last summer and fall. Um, which is where we were able to obtain all of this data that I'll be presenting for to you today. Um, so again, um, as Sarah mentioned, thank you all for your participation in this research. I could not have done this without you, um, and it's what made this research possible. So now going into our findings and our results. So first, um, our results, we had kind of four overall overarching themes that we found, and I will dive into each of these in pretty lengthy detail in the following slides. Um, with voices from, again, individuals within the communities. So first, our results from our interview, interviews indicated that climactic and ecological changes are having impacts on the safety of Norton Sound red king crab fishers and also their ability to participate in Norton Sound red king crab fisheries in the ways that they would like to. Next, changes in crab um, are affecting harvesters' subsistence practices, and with that, their ability to access crab in ways which impact their food sovereignty. Um, and finally, recent management policies, um, people felt that these have also constrained fishers' ability to adapt and to participate 
in additional ways. So now, again, I'll go into each of these themes in more detail and share with you what participants had to say um, and how their knowledge and experiences really support these four overarching themes. So next slide, Sarah. So when discussing climate change, participants often spoke of a variety of observations that they felt are linked to and resulting from climate change. This included these ideas left listed here um, on the left-hand side of the screen, um, which include these. So bigger, more frequent storms, less stable ice conditions, changes in ocean rain, wetter conditions, um, unpredictable, increased unpredictable um, weather patterns, changes in wind direction, smaller crab and shorter seasons. And within these discussions, participants then discuss the impacts that these observed changes have on them, on their families, on their communities, or in other words, these social impacts of climate change. So these included areas of discussion around safety concerns, um, increased risk that individuals felt when fishing through the ice or by being uh, physically on the ice, um, loss of gear um, and what that meant for them financially. Um, they talked about the unpredictability and weather and seasons and in management and how Again, many of these I'll dive into um, deeper on these next slides. Participants also discuss the impacts that change is having on subsistence activities. And lastly, participants um, discuss changes in relation to their reliance on um, specific fisheries, such as um, the summer fishery, the summer Norton Sound Red King crab fishery, which requires a boat due to these changes. Um, and I'll have a quote to kind of support that here in a moment. So next slide. So first, um, in relation to climactic changes and impacts on safety, participants commonly mentioned, again, changes in sea ice, warming water temperatures, and increased frequency and severity of storms. While most participants observed warming waters throughout the Norton Sound regions, uh, region, these same participants had theories as to how this warm water and resulting changes in sea ice are affecting their own and their others' physical safety. So for example, one participant said, some people go later than we do into the sea, you know. They're more comfortable on the ice. They're comfortable with the idea of water skipping, um, which I never want to do. What if the ice breaks off and there's a lead between you and the shore best ice? Can you skip it on your snow machine? I don't want to do that. So we're always really paying attention to the weather. And this idea of um, skipping, which I learned, had never heard of before talking with these individuals, um, just to give you some of you that may not be from the Norton Sound region, but this is the idea of jumping a snowmobile over um, between two pieces of ice and over, over open water. So participants also described how these same changes in ice affect their ability in participating in the winter uh, commercial Norton Sound Red King Crab fishery, making it more difficult for them to participate. Whereas one participant said, another big change we used to be able to winter, we used to be able to winter crab. There is a winter crab fishery, but it has to be through the ice. And because our ocean rain isn't staying for, it either freezes really good and blows right away, or it just doesn't freeze well at all. So we haven't been able to winter crab. So we are strictly doing the summer red king crab fisheries. In this instance, it's the changes in sea ice that have not only affected the fisher's ability to access harvesting locations, but also their ability to participate within this fishery at all. And next, in addition to warming waters and ice melt, many participants uh, mentioned increased frequency, uncertainty and timing, and or the severity of storms in the Norton Sound region that have implications for safety. This increased uncertainty of storms affects how fishers, both subsistence and commercial, can prepare their boats and secure or collect their crab pots that they have out in the water, which again have financial effects on these resource users. In addition, for summer commercial fishers that may harvest in the summer subsistence fishery as well in the Norton Sound region, this inability to predict these storm events has extreme implications for physical safety. So for example, one participant said, um, in the context of increased safety concerns, um, one that's involved with the summer commercial uh, fishery said, my dad this season had to call May Day for the first time in 50 years on the water. And that is because these storms seem to be coming a lot faster and changing when once they get here it seems to be way less predictable. The level of uncertainty of storms is having significant impacts on even the most knowledgeable of fishers, those that have been involved with these fisheries for decades. And in this particular example, while this highly experienced fisher had particular knowledge um, to retain the fishing pots on the vessel in order to reduce the likelihood of capsizing, the levels of uncertainty or of timing and severity of storms in the Norton Sound region 
pose an even greater risk to new or less experienced fishers that maybe lack that same knowledge to keep the crab pots on the boat that may be more incentivized by economic reward or potentially um, increased payoff by casting those pots. So next slide. So as the winter subsistence Norton Sound Red King crab fishery is a through the ice fishery, participants physically have to be on the ice to drill holes to lower these um, crab pots into the oceans. Again, many participants are involved in what's called skipping. Um, so as ice melts and becomes more unstable and increasingly more unpredictable as conditions are drastically changing from year to year, this uncertainty has implications for how harvesters evaluate risk in terms of their physical safety. This particular participant is only willing to accept lower risk um, and weather and ice conditions and justifies this by saying, this is for fun. This is for subsistence. I mean, this is to eat crab all winter, right? So I just tolerate less risk. Yeah, you know, and we've lost our pots before by not pulling them when a storm came. That sucks. Furthermore, what levels of risk harvesters are willing to take to harvest these crab are dependent upon the knowledge that they hold in navigating adverse ice conditions and the distance harvesters are willing to travel. To place crab pots, monitor harvests, and secure pots during storms, harvesters must travel to and from these crab pot locations fairly frequently. So if harvesters want to select locations of more connected or stable ice conditions that have lower risk or to reduce the competition needed to increase catch, this requires additional money and time for travel to those locations, increasing barriers to participation. For example, some harvesters, as this participant stated, some people have a much better understanding, I think, of ice conditions and what is acceptable risk for them. When discussing this risk, this participant describes it as a compromise. You might want to go further out away from other fishers, further away from other fishers, but it's, it's more time to go out and check it. And some people are perfectly okay with like, you know, having a long, long way to go to set and check. And you got to check your pot at least, I'd say every five days. Ultimately, these climactic changes felt in the Norton Sound region are affecting um, participants' physical safety. They're affecting how fishers evaluate risk. And it's making it more difficult for individuals to partic participate in certain fisheries. So on to our next theme. So beyond these climactic changes, participants also commonly mentioned experiencing low returns, decreases in the size and the health of crab, um, and changes in the timing of crab season. And many of these issues were discussed in conjunction with the closures and crashes that Sarah introduced earlier um, that have occurred over the last um, couple decades as well. So for example, one participant noted that the previous couple of years, we were getting much smaller crab, much fewer crab. Another mentioned that we used to have, you know, two months of crab season, and now it's less than a month most years. These changes impacted participants' ability to access crab for subsistence purposes. Given that crab is not as critical to the diets as other subsistence foods, such as salmon, which some people talked about, this did not necessarily impact participants' food security or their ability to access enough food to lead, lead a healthy and active lifestyle. As one participant put it, so, you know, is anybody going to starve because there's not as many king crab? No, but this is a part of the wider context of subsistence at this time. Participants noted how a decline or lack in king crab could be substituted by other subsistence foods and saying, you're not just relying on one resource, right? Maybe you get some terrestrial resources, you get some fish, you get some berries, there's some greens, maybe people in your family have marine mammals and you get marine mammal fat. Maybe you're bartering at other places and you're getting stuff from other places that you don't get locally. And that's robust. That's healthy. And you can, you can account for maybe not doing so well with one thing. So I just kind of picked up my effort on the other thing. However, the decline in king crab did impact participants' food sovereignty and that these individuals were not able to access a resource which holds such personal and cultural significance to them and which they have relied on as a part of a suite of subsistence food. Next slide, well, thank you. So the changes in abundance of Norton Sound Red King Crab next impacted participants' subsistence practices, which is this third theme, in several ways. One participant noted how the closures of the crab season impacted their familial ties with this quote saying, getting the boats ready, it's almost like our family time. 
Like that's when all of us truly spend hours together finally. And that's another reason why we enjoy it. And so it's really different not being able to do that. Another participant noted the importance to the local, particularly Inupiat culture saying, I think it's a huge thing culturally for us in this region. So much of what the subsistence activities are not simply about calories on the table. All these practices, which are rooted in, you know, culture and tradition going back thousands of years, they contribute to a lot of, a lot in a lot of ways. I mean, it's cultural connectedness, it's ties, you know, families, individuals, and families and communities together through barter and sharing and trade. They said, it's important because of what it is. It ties you to the land. It ties some people to their heritage and history. There's something very satisfying and being able to provide food to others. In this way, crabbing was tied to many participants' identities and their sense of self. As a consequence, not being able to harvest crab or as many crab impacted the mental health of some of these individuals. For example, one participant described feeling a sense of failure when not being able to harvest crab for his family and saying, crabbing is more of a mental health thing than critical to my survival these days. A lot of my self-worth is tied up in my ability to provide stuff, provide ducks or provide moose or provide salmon or crab or whatever. So when I can't do that, I, sense, I feel a sense of failure sometimes. Overall, and the key takeaway here is that these impacts indicate how the health and abundance of crab is intimately tied to human health, both physical, cultural, and spiritual, and mental. All right, and then on to our fourth theme. So management challenges and participation. Overall, these changes in crab abundance and health were attributed to various factors by different participants. Some acknowledge the role of climate change and other ecological changes, such as the influx of predator species, um, such as pollock or cod within the region, while others blame historic policies or flawed management practices for these negative changes, which leads us to this theme. The contributions of management to the Norton Sound Red King crab decline and issues with participation. So some participants noted a combination of factors they believe contributed to the decline of Norton Sound Red King crab in recent years, including um, high guideline harvest levels or GHLs, and concerns over increased permits as drivers for these declines. Some also discussed how they felt that increased permits have led to increased competition felt within the fisheries. In relation to the summer commercial fishery, one participant said, there's a number of vessels participating and it seems to be the same number, but very different participants. So each time a boat or two comes into the fishery, another boat will leave. It doesn't seem to have enough resource for more vessels. So I think it's important for the North Pacific Fishery Management Council to know and understand that the fishery should be limited to a certain number. Another participant said, in the crab fishery, my biggest challenge has just been, has been just competition, you know? I can compete with anybody, but you can only divide it by so many ways, honestly. So if you get a lot of participation, you know that's less for everybody. So those are probably my biggest challenges. While these participants were concerned about the effects of increased permits on fisher competition and harvest levels within the Norton Sound Red King crab fisheries, other interview participants also noted the positive impacts um, such that the CDQ groups that these have on Alaskan communities, which have not, should not be negated. Um, for example, one participant said, as far as the competition for the crab, and that's something the CDQ group has done that I like, they will only buy crab from you and they will only sell you bait if you're a local of the region. To address, to address this concern, over competition, one participant suggested a shift to a license limitation program loaning. And additionally, um, Fisher's voice concerns and frustrations over management's continual focus on commercial sectors and the lack of attention to the needs of artisanal, which are small scale fishers, or subsistence fisheries. Artisanal or subsistence sectors and their practices are intricately linked to Alaskan fish. Alaskan culture and the mixed and subsistence economies in place and increased, increased attention to these sectors is needed to allow these types of fishers to more successfully participate in the fishery. Finally, a number of participants had suggestions as to how to address these concerns over management, where one participant said, we now should be up in the Chukchi Sea doing surveys up there yearly, or at least every couple of years, because in order to see what the change is going on and in how things are changing up there will help, give an idea of change here. 
Are species moving up there and not coming back or dying? I guess the big one is research. To understand what is going on right now is the biggest thing. We have to look at where we'll be going with a lot of these new, with a lot of these species. This quote supports the call made by many that I talked to for more responsive and more adaptive management that reflects the rapid change that's being experienced by fishers um, within this region. And this call is necessary as fishers acknowledge that the change is not slowing and that they are going to have to adapt. So overall, these management issues described by participants indicate that there are opportunities for improvement to more readily enable fishers, both com commercial and subsistence, to more successfully participate in Norton Sound red king crab fisheries in the face of a changing climate and drastic ecological changes. These direct suggestions from participants indicate that many already have their own ideas about how these issues can be improved, um, which I will go into now in further detail. So again, I just wanna to touch on these ideas and these came directly from participants that I spoke with. So in navigating uncertainty and increased severity of storms, participants requested the need, to, the need for improved accessible weather predictions as this could help them with time needed to secure their boats and crab pots and with making decisions about when to head offshore or when they need to head back in. And many participants also suggested the need for managers to further consider the mixed economy of Alaska and the importance of subsistence practices within this region, as mentioned briefly. Some mentioned the need for increased representation of small scale and subsistence fisheries, uh, fishing and management. And others mentioned the need to examine the effects that increasing permits have in Norton Sound Red King crab fisheries. Um, and lastly, uh, participants generally called for increased flexibility and responsiveness to local needs within management, with some even mentioning glimpses of hope that they've seen in recent years for management um, that include and have included increased listening, um, and they'd like people to act further on these local concerns. And so that is what we found throughout the region. Those are the voices of Norton Sound communities, and now I'm going to hand it back off to Sarah. Thanks, Jess. Um, yeah, so I'll just quickly go over um, the general conclusions of, of what Jess just went over in some detail. <clears throat> Red King crab fisheries uh, support community well-being, food sovereignty, cultural cohesion, and also uh, a personal sense of, of um, value and connection to both the land, but also to the communities. And climate change is directly affecting key commercial and subsistence fisheries, such as red king crab. This is increasing safety concerns and risks um, of actually going out and harvesting crab. There's greater unpredictability in weather, in the fisheries, as well as in the management, which is leading to a lot of uncertainty and also leading to a lot of community concerns about food sovereignty, um, about uh, subsistence activities, and uh, it's definitely impacting uh, cultural, mental, and community health. In addition, decreases in abundance and size of crab in the past few years have impacted subsistence fishing in particular, which really <clears throat> has strong cultural and personal significance in the Norton Sound region. So while it, we're not necessarily hearing that uh, the declines in red king crab are impacting food security, um, there is that lack of the, or the decline in red king crab subsistence is being keenly felt by participants who rely on it as a part of their culture and individual identity. And this emphasizes the need for a greater focus on access to um, sustainable subsistence fishing. So, also just a, a, a brief word on including local knowledge and multiple knowledge systems into management, into ecosystem-based fisheries management, and how this can really enrich uh, the stories and the understanding behind the impacts of and the connections of fisheries to fishing communities. So it can better inform decision-making. It also, uh, works to increase dialogue uh, across people um, both in the ground but uh, sorry on the ground not in the ground with the council uh, with scientists and across sectors 
It can inform management goals and research uh, projects and priorities. And it can also address conflict in, um, in, in interesting ways and in ways that allow for greater dialogue earlier in the process. And it can also provide the best available climate, ecological, and cultural information by including uh, local knowledge in the process <clears throat> and in the research that we're doing. This highlights um, what, what these findings really align nicely with other work that has been done, including a paper from Mengel and Dowling in 2016 that sort of emphasized this, um, this trade-off of evaluating between the revenue from um, fisheries or a particular fishing. In their case, they were talking about herring, um, commercial herring versus the survival and reproduction of seabirds or mammals that rely on those herring. And then the social capital derived by indigenous people gifting the row of herring and how these various ways to use value and um, the varying importance of um, a, a species like red king crab has a challenge because um, these values aren't equal or non-commensurate. And so this finding really rings true way outside of the way red king crab fishery and goes beyond um, just this case study that we're talking about. So whereas commercial and our subsistence fisheries harvest the same resource or the same stock, there's still some trade-offs that can really be illustrated and highlighted in the discussions that we've been able to have with folks in Norton Sound. Other issues that participants mentioned in fisheries was, um, I think Jess went over really uh, clearly, and we can open that up to questions. And uh, just to very briefly talk about what's next. Um, I talked already about the implications for other fisheries and specifically other crab fisheries and the need to continue to include local knowledge into um, ecosystem-based fisheries management processes, as well as, um, as we're moving towards more climate information in our management processes, this will also help to strengthen that information and access to information we have. And then the need to really expand social science research um, at the Alaska Fishery Science Center and beyond through these increased participatory methods so that we can get um, at people's experiences, people's stories, and people's perspectives to bring it to light into the research. So I think that's all we have at this point, and um, I would be love to hear questions and discussion and open it up to the floor. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sarah and Jessica, for your presentation. This it, Before we go to questions, so while you're working on your question, either for the chat box or for in person, um, this is a good time for Straight Science audience to give a little love to the speakers in the chat box or however you like to do that. Some people do their thing. Yeah, look at that. People know how to clap. I can barely manage that. But anyway, um, because it's not easy to be a speaker and I, I didn't mention, but they are on a different time zone. So it's a lot later for them as well. So um, thank you both so much for taking the time tonight and um, bringing your findings back to the region. That is really important and very appreciated. Um, right off the bat, Charlie has his hand up for the first question. Go for it, Charlie. Hi, yeah, good, good talk. And, and I, I agree that, you know, Western science is pretty chauvinistic sometimes and doesn't, doesn't talk to the people that actually use the resource. Um, I'm, I'm a former Fisher's manager, so I can say that. Um, I saw a couple of mistakes I thought I, I needed to correct and I'm maybe I'm nitpicky. The uh, Department of Fish and Game did not close the fishery. The Board of Fisheries closed the fishery and Fish and Game screamed and yelled the whole time. So that's that's a very different thing. And then uh, it's not shore best ice, it's shore fast ice. That's ice that's stuck to the beach or called shelf ice sometimes. 
Um, anyway, uh, I think I think that some of the things that were attributed to climate change are are have to do more with fisheries management, like the the small size of crab in recent years. That's a that's a fisheries population issue, not not so much dealing with climate change, but with um, over harvest of the older age classes, over utilization of the older age classes. And, and one of the things that I had hoped to, to hear comments on was um, impacts of, of uh, unstable ice and, and pot loss and, and therefore um, what people call ghost fishing, where, where crab are still being caught in pots that nobody can can go after things like that. I think there's, I think that's a real concern here. And I'm, I'm worried about that. But I, I like the overall, just to the talk, which was, you know, more communication and, and more teamwork. So thank you. I have a question. Just um, all right, Roy, can you wait? Cause Franz Muter had his hand up first, if that's okay. Absolutely. I didn't put my hand up. I don't know where to put my hand up. I, I often Sorry. don't know. Go right ahead, Roy. Go uh, right ahead. I can wait. Uh, okay. Franz says, go ahead, Roy. You're well, looking. thank you. Um, so there's Thanks, Franz. Uh, I, I, great presentation. Excellent work. It's, it's challenging to, to, to get information from people. And anyway, so though one thing on skipping that I understand on skipping is you start off uh, your snowmobile and you're sitting on dry land, or excuse me, on ice or something, and it's level. So when you gun your snow machine, you go across the water, skipping. The snow machine track is going fast enough to keep you afloat till you hit the other side and get on. The, uh, wherever you're going, you're going across a body of water, and um, you have a you could see where you're going, and you can go quite a ways if you understand how to do that. So that's my general understanding of skipping. Um, just so you know a little bit about me, I, I'm born and raised here, and I'm an Alaska native from White Mountain, and been living in Nome since '82 and have done a lot of winter crab fishing. And um, <clears throat> so one thing on climate change that besides the climate, in the climate change conversation and or visual aspects that I try to do now is not mainly for, oh, let me, yeah, for, <laughs> excuse me, on, on uh, sorry for my, um, bouncing around in information, but we use the um, the current weather, the the weather system that gives us the ice location, and it's really good, by the way. The NOAA information on ice. Also, um, one thing I've learned, and others too, is if we see a low coming up from south of us on the, here in the Norton Sound. And depending on when you look at it, you could see it's coming and you got like a two, three day notice more often than not even a day notice. Um, you can go move your pot before you um, let the weather come in and lift the, because it's a low coming up that it forces the water level up and lifts the ice off offshore. So that's one thing that, so there are some um, if there is information out there that would help you make some quality decisions. And I forgot what the other thing I was going to talk about. Oh, the ghost, the ghost crabbing. I've done that a lot, not, not on purpose. Um, we call it illegal trolling. Oh, that's another one term for that. It's kind of cool. Sounds better. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, just, uh, just a few things. There should be some follow up on these questions as to um, when we talk about climate change and that kind of thing, we're all living it and we're making adjustments. And so 
I'll just point a couple of things out. That one on the uh, main thing was on my my understanding of skipping could be different, and then uh, on the climate information, there is quality information that is is pretty current and pretty reliable for many different things besides grabbing. All right, thank you, Roy. Thank you, Roy. Appreciate that. Jessica or Sarah, you have any anything to add or? I just wanted to say quickly, thank you for both those comments. It's really very valuable to hear and I really appreciate it. Um, I also think hearing where the people get their information and what's valuable um, and and what's actually being used is, is fantastic because you never really know how people who um, who need the information how they're using and finding what they need. So that's great. So I appreciate that all. Alrighty. Um, and go ahead, Franz. <coughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, thanks for that presentation. Uh, I unfortunately, I don't know, something happened on my end. I got disconnected for probably half of it, <laughs> missed most of it, although I was really interested. And so one of the reasons that I'm interested in that, as you probably know, is uh, Council's SSC. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, co-chair of the Council SSC right now. We <clears throat> had um, kind of suggested <clears throat> this and asked for something like this not really knowing how we might use that or what it might provide and um unfortunately i still don't know so my one of my questions is if you are um already planning on uh, maybe presenting some of this uh, some of the results um at an ssc forum so that's one question uh, that may be on us to ask for it um uh, but the the other um thing that i want to just mention is that the um, council actually, or the SSC, and thanks for the clarification, Gay, yeah, it's the Scientific and Statistical Committee of the of the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, is actually holding a workshop in February that's focusing on the Northern Bering Sea, and people are welcome to come in person. The, the meeting is in Seattle or um, attend um, uh, uh, online. Um, we're also looking for, for input and um, public testimony on that because the council really is struggling with how to deal with some of the um, big changes that manifest themselves, particularly in the northern Bering Sea and Bering Strait region for managing the sort of Bering Sea fisheries. Um, so I just wanted to mention that as an opportunity for, for folks to um, provide some um, ideas and input. Um, so again, unfortunately, I can't really ask a question because I missed most of it. But uh, my my only real question is whether you have already thought about presenting this to the SSC. Yeah, uh, definitely. And I think we do have to be invited for that. But we did produce, um, I think we're just, we the draft is already produced for a brief um, couple page sort of summary of critical results. And we'll be presenting or providing that uh, in paper format or electric format, electronic format to council advisory bodies, including the SSC. So the information will be available. Also, this uh, all these slides um, are available and that sort of thing. But I I would be happy, and I I've been talking with um, Brian Garber Garber Yance as well, just to see like where we could fit in providing this information to be helpful. Um, but unfortunately, I don't know that we're able to present without, it's so hard to find room on the agenda at this point. Um, but we're open, so whatever works out, uh, but at the very least we do, we will have that summary report that will be provided. Okay, that, that sounds great. Um, and uh, you're certainly welcome to, <clears throat> since you are, I think you're Seattle based, right? Yeah. Um, the um, you're, you're certainly welcome to come to the meeting too, and um, there, there'll be an opportunity for sort of an open mic session to um, talk about issues. Great, yeah, we'll definitely do that. Thank you, Franz. I saw you keep dropping off. This is being recorded, so there will be. I can send you the link to the recording when when we get it. And um, just so you know, uh, just an idea because I have 
I have not really seen anything public about this meeting that you're talking about. And it seems like it's a wonderful opportunity for many, many people in the Bering Strait region. The, the North Pacific Fisheries, sorry, I didn't get it right, P Fisheries Management Council, are, are they doing any kind of outreach like putting ads in newspapers like the Gnome Nugget or any of our um, regional media to, to uh, sort of part get participation and awareness of this? Um, for for this, not really, and we kind of struggled with that a little bit. So this, the SSC kind of traditionally in February um, puts on sort of a workshop for their own, um, you know, the kinds of things, themes, topics that we're interested in. And we had suggested this, we got buy-in from the council, and then we thought, so well, how, typically it's just sort of a discussion among researchers and um, SSC members and council members to kind of figure out um, council stuff, you know, how to deal with an issue. Um, and then for this one, we obviously thought, well, you know, we should kind of, um, we should kind of, uh, provide an opportunity for broader input because it's really science based. So what, what do we know? What do we not know and need to know? And what do we need to monitor and that sort of thing? And then the, a good part of it is uh, a large part of it is really figuring out, well, from, uh, uh, you know, what are some of the tools that we can deal with just sort of shifting distributions and that sort of thing. Um, and so the council did their usual thing and just um, uh, posted this on online on the website. And, um, okay. and that's how people sort of get the information that are already in the loop, but we didn't do a huge outreach effort and I didn't realize it until fairly recently. And that's why I sent you the email. Um, there'll be the, the, there's a limited time for input too, so we we can't really make it. Um, you know, we don't have time for um, having uh, you know a day of um, uh, just um, input from um, from a lot of people because we just don't have the time to do it, basically. Um, but having said that. Um, you know, it is a public forum, it is an open forum, but we did not advertise it as widely as we could have. Okay, I'm putting the link just to the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council website, NPFMC, in the chat box. And where would somebody go to find more information if it's on the... Just just to the link for the upcoming meeting, and then there's okay. links to whatever the SEC is doing, what the council is doing. And, yeah. All right. Yeah, it sounds very interesting, honestly. Um, We'll try to make it. Thank you very much, Franz. Um, Wes, go ahead. You're next. Yeah. Th thank you. And and first, uh, thank you, um, uh, Sarah and Jessica, for your, the the, uh, the presentation tonight and the um, the just this research. I think it's it's really valuable and. It's kind of unique that the when you were in Nome in in September and then uh, today, the days you're presenting this the topic of Norton Sound king crab is is actually before the crab plan team, which is uh, under the the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council. So today this afternoon we were talking about Norton Sound red king crab there, and I think many times especially when the, the largest review of this information for at the crab plan team is all people that are not familiar with the region, that there's a lot of times um, some of the diff how this how this fishery differs from other places farther south is lost. And, and this kind of research really helps, I think, with that. Um, and then I guess I'll just throw in a point kind of back to Franz's um, uh, mention of the of the meeting in in February at the at the SSC on the northern Bering Sea and the southern Chukchi. I look at that, and when you look at the the agenda for that, a lot of it that this is the first step of looking at what needs to be done, what information needs to to learn, and it's it's it, to me it's like this is really the kind of the first step in the process of, of really understand, you know, trying to get at more of what is needed um, in the, in the Northern Bering Sea and Southern Chukchi to understand how things are, are going to affect both commercial subsistence and, and uh, fisheries both and, and how that may be um, going to affect the, the region, the region's uh, 
you know, species. So thank you. Thanks again for the presentation. All right. Thank you, Wes. Charlie, your hand is still up. I don't know if you've been so patient and I've, I haven't noticed or if that was still your hand from before. Well, I guess my hand got stuck, but yeah, just to tag on okay. to, to what uh, Wes said about the the uh, the migration of crab moving north and so forth. The, one of my frustrations over the years has been the the, the council and, and the states kind of bent to go to big fishing to uh, to develop new fisheries and I there's crab are colonizing Kotzebue Sound and if you want to give local people a chance to uh, to transition from from purely subsistence to to local sales it's it's really important to have regulations and rules like we we had it took us more than a decade it took almost 20 years for us to uh, make it a small boat fishery in Norton Sound and make it super exclusive. And that made it a fishery, some people call it art, artisanal, but it's a fishery that locals participate in and the, and the revenue goes to the communities. And that's, that's awfully important and would be shame to see Kotzebue develop uh, differently. So uh, just a comment and thank you. Hey, uh, Charlie, I, I hear you and that Com those comments need to, you know, the council needs to hear that when, whenever you can. Okay, Charlie, you better sign up for that February 7 meeting. Okay. Seriously. Sounds like it. All right. D this is Roy. Hi, Roy. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you, Charlie, for that information. And, and and how valuable the, the commercial take and subsistence take for crab is local. That's really important. I remember the, the time when, when it wasn't and the change, uh, there was some, some change from the major commercial fleet, not, not just a couple of commercial fleet guys come up, but it was uh, I the advisory committee uh, report through Charlie's effort well, we made a, a good pitch to make this change and it was, and it was it's been invaluable. So hopefully, uh, if nothing else, one, one suggestion is to meet with the Kotzebue advisory to inform them of, or, or and local subsistence users up there, figure out who would be good um, contact people to help Offer these changes and then see if see if they could see value in that. I mean, I to have a local fishery, to have our people here, crabbing when the opportunity exists, and then uh, to the two ladies that did the presentation. Hopefully, there's some questions in the future about um, what I don't know how you're going to do this. It's going to be challenging, but uh, I believe the the COVID situation did impact what's going on in, in a positive way. That sounds kind of weird, but if you're not out taking these fish, if everyone is, nobody's commercial fish, nobody, hardly anybody's um, crabbing, then this resource has a little chance to rebound because the situation on earth in regards to human, human um, dilemma in its reaction to try to Save themselves from getting COVID prevented a lot of normal activity. So some of these resources may, may rebound because of that at some level. And then um, hopefully Charlie or someone could let me know, not let me know, but inform us whether or not the, because let me back up a little bit and qualify what I want to say here. Last year we uh, subsistence crab, my nephew and I, and I, at the end of the season, I think we got 100-ish crab with one pot. So, and this is just one pot in front of Nome, just a little uh, out in front of the Swanberg Dredge. And it was great. And um, really enjoyed, you know, eating and sharing the food. 
And so I'm wondering if the data out there that Charlie talked about that when the commercial take uh, took a lot of the um, larger crab and, and maybe help cause a decline, if there's a rebound, if there's information on whether or not the crab has rebound either due to COVID and or the commercial take has been reduced and they're on the rebound. I don't know if that part's true, but would appreciate it from not, maybe not at this meeting, but um, um, I, I think I could figure out maybe later on how to get that information. But I wanted to mainly take on to Charlie's conversation about if there's an opportunity to, to have the Kotzebue people involved in creating a picture similar to ours, I think that would be helpful. Thank you, Roy, that's a great idea. And if Jessica and Sarah are not familiar with who you are, can you leave or, or somehow you guys leave your emails down in the chat box or however you wanna be contacted so that you guys can pick up that thread later too? on your own? I believe I do have um, some of your contact information. Okay. I'll follow up with you after this. Awesome. Thank All you right. I have a question. My question isn't about the crabs because I'm not really a good crab person, but I heard you, my ears went up because there's been some conversations going around um, about, you know, better weather data and things like that. So when you guys said in your results were a lot of one of them was you were your participants were saying they wanted uh, more accessible or better weather data. Are you hopefully some of this is somehow getting brought to the attention of the National Weather Service and the FAA. And I say that because we have a lot of instrumentation Currently, we need a lot more, but we have a lot of instrumentation throughout the Bering Strait region that just is in place and it is not maintained. So we are not getting data. And unfortunately, that is can be extremely frustrating because th that data in the strait, especially, would it's it seems all you need is someone to go out and fix it. And uh, somehow that, that gets lost. So um, is that something that you're, when you see something like that, that's important to the Bering Strait region and to the economics of this region. Is that something you think of, or is there a cross pollination there in your data? It would be maybe a good voice to add to that, this need we have. Yeah, I think that's one of the great, that's a great example of how maybe what we might not have imagined having those connections or that information that crosstalk um, come up it's that this generates those kind of conversations so okay. um that isn't that wasn't certainly wasn't something that we identified as a need early before doing the research but now having it really be one of the elements that participants highlighted as being incredibly important not just for um, you know, whether or not deciding whether or not to go out, but how to prepare and the safety concerns and so forth. So I would say two different things. Um, the National Weather Service, we, we are in partnership with some from the social science end. I can't speak to the non-social science end, but from the social science end, there's definitely some overlap and some conversations um, happening about greater partnerships and collaborations moving forward. So uh, I'm hopeful that that will continue to happen. Then the other part is really climatic trends. So not so much weather, but also um, sort of longer term trends. So people can start not just deciding whether to go out that day or, or that week um, or know if a storm's coming in, but also to start making plans um, in the longer time frame. And there, there's a lot of that happening, particularly um, <clears throat> there had been a lot in the lower Bering Sea, now moving upward, um, there's some modeling efforts that are going on, really trying to tie it to the fisheries that are important to the communities so that people can start to make those decisions with that information. So I think it's moving in the right direction. 
Right. And thank you. Cause I think, you know, if we see an opportunity, I'm going to call you up and say, Hey, give your, give your spiel about, you know, what you found that the voices of this region, that's not no joke here is the weather and what is frustratingly to me fixable um, as opposed to putting in all new gear. I mean, it's already in place. So it's kind of cost-effective if we just fixed it. So uh, thank you very much on that. Dean. Oh my gosh, your hand is up. Thanks for your patience. Yeah, first of all, my apologies for coming on late. But uh, one thing that subsistence depends on is a diversity of food. And you've mentioned climate change and a lot of kind of vagaries in that, that sense. But I know with the loss of a cold pool, you have Pacific cod, you have Pollock large adult Pollock moving north, competing with a crab. What are your feelings on uh, that, that competition diminishing the population of red crab? And I know you're primarily focused on the safety of, of people going out and looking at it. And that's, again, that's all weather related. That's all good. I understand that. But that population of red crab is constantly now under attack from species from the south. And so how do you look at that? Uh, Jess, you wanna talk about people, cause I know people did definitely speak to that in the interviews as well. If you had any, um, anything you wanted to say about how people were observing that. Yeah, um, that, that was definitely something that a number of individuals um, did talk about, and it's something that we documented, and it is mentioned in some of our writings and reports and things that are going um, forth to council as well. So it's not something that we necessarily, necessarily are intentionally trying to negate. We only had so much time to talk about things, but that is definitely something that people talked about. Um, and then I, I think one thing that can really be done, and I think that this study showed us in particular, is that there does need to be further research on that area, like what, because again, this was a very small sample size, like we only talked to eight individuals, but I think the larger the sample size and talking to more people will give us a more accurate understanding of how people are observing these changes in cod and pollock and how they believe those to be um, affecting the, the king crab. Um, and juvenile king crab. Um, but that is definitely something that was touched upon. So thank you for that. Yeah, I think it's it's what you're mentioning is something that we're seeing from a lot of different sources. So people mentioning it from Norton Sound area, but also the the surveys that are going, the ships that are going out and, and sampling um, are seeing that sort of migration as well. And I suspect it's not something that's gonna be changing. Um, you know, I don't think species are necessarily gonna be heading back south. So it's one of those things that we may not have a sense of to what degree that's happening yet. And that's where further research is needed for sure. All right. I hope that got you your answer, Dean. Yep, thank you. All right. Uh, any other questions? I guess my 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 last question would be: What's the next steps for you with your project? Is is it done, or do you come back and and should we see more of you, or any, or are you just finishing? And that's give it give you a second to sort of regroup. I think for this phase, we have completed this phase, and now it's a matter of getting. Uh, this is our first step in trying to get back to uh, the information back to people and then I mentioned the brief summary report that will go to SSCA and council and the crab plan team and then um, from there I think some of what we because this is a very small study I think what we were trying to also emphasize is how these methods can be used and so we are going to be taking these methods further into other projects and I think actually um, recently, well, there's been a couple, um, there's a few projects that are uh, building and trying to get off, off the ground that involve some of these methods in terms of participatory research and talking with people and doing um, some long 
open-ended interviews and really trying to document how people who have lived in these places, um, what they've learned and what they can share with us. So, um, and this will be Norton Sound and, and beyond, uh, not necessarily about red king crab, but other what we're calling, you know, important species or species of concern or what people have really relied on and uh, feel connected to over the, over the years and over generations. So I'd say next step very shortly with this project, wrap it up, get the information back out there so it can be used. And then also try and get some feedback on what people thought was helpful, uh, what could be used in the management context, as well as maybe in decision making on the ground, and then try and build up capacity for this kind of research, more of this kind of research. Because we have a lot of um, water ta table sampling and this and that, and that's wonderful, but I think we also, it's important to really get this level of context and this level of participation with the community. All right. Any other last questions or any other questions, thoughts, comments for Sarah or Jessica? All right. If not, we'll close it out. The next straight science next week, um, we are not going to have straight science. The, we're taking a break for the Alaska Marine Science Symposium, which will be in Anchorage. And, and I hope to see some travel and actually go to a symposium in person. So that'll be quite something. Next time we are up at bat will be February 1st. And the topic can't be any more bearing straight science than a gentleman from Gamble harvested a emperor goose. And when he went to open it up, uh, there was a implanted satellite transmitter tag type equipment, and that initiated a lot of questions. And we tracked down who is doing the research on emperor goose, the emperor geese, and it turns out it's the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and they have a project down in, sort of towards the southwest, sorry, southeast of Nome, and um, outside of our region, further down Bethel area, and. Um, can't be any more bearing straight. So th this one dropped out of the sky and we followed it down and Fishing Game is going to give us a talk on what they're doing and what they're finding with their project that may not be started here, but it's certainly coming through here if, if we're able to um, find out about it from the inside of an emperor goose. So stay tuned for that on February 1st. And uh, Sarah and Jessica, if you could stay on for just one second when we when we close off. And with that, thank you all for coming and we'll see you February 1.